Swinburne University of Technology. Welcome back to part two of the week three lecture. Now, in the first part of the lecture, we looked at describing the distribution of a metric variable and then at the one sample t-test. Now we're going to have a look at the equivalent analyses and reports for a categorical variable. So let's start with type of occupation. And you can see it has three categories, professional, managerial, and clerical. So it's a categorical variable, just a limited number of categories. And to describe the distribution of a categorical variable, we would look at the frequency table and the percentage bar chart. So let's have a look at what this output is telling us about the distribution of occupation. First, notice that there are a whole heap of missing values here. And that's because in this sample there were a lot of people who weren't actually employed, so type of occupation wasn't a relevant question for them. But of the 230 people that were employed, 49% of them were in clerical jobs, and 38% in managerial jobs, and about 13% in professional jobs. So the main features that we're looking for when we're describing the distribution of a categorical variable is what's the most common category. So here, the most common occupation was clerical, with 49%. So if we're to write a formal report describing the distribution of a categorical variable, we should give the percentage bar chart to give people a quick visual impression of what the distribution looks like. We should talk about what's typical, that is, we should talk about what's the most common category, but we need to be really careful with the use of the word majority. If you look at this particular example, 49.1% of the respondents were in clerical jobs. That's not a majority. It's the most common response, but you can only use the word majority if the percentage is greater than 50%. So having described what's typical, you might look at any other interesting features that stand out in the bar chart, and your report might look something like this. The distribution of occupation type for a sample of 230 people in paid employment is displayed in Figure 1. And again, notice we're referring to the caption Figure 1, and our graph is carefully captioned and it has a title. The report's really brief. The next sentence, the most common type of occupation was clerical, 49%, but managerial positions were also common, 38%. And that's really all we need to say. We don't need to describe every possible bar in the bar chart, just a few important features. So let's look at a second example. According to the Australian Bureau of Statistics, in 2010, 25% of adult Australians travelled overseas. Now, a travel agent claims that the percentage of people travelling overseas has increased since 2010. How would we go about testing that hypothesis? The population here is all adult Australians, but we can't ask all of them whether they've travelled overseas in the last 12 months. So what we do is we take a sample. And in this case, we've taken a sample of 111 Australian adults, and we've asked each person in the sample if they've travelled overseas in the last 12 months. So this is a categorical variable. Either they travelled overseas in the last 12 months or they didn't. We'd start then by using the frequencies procedure to see how the travel destination is distributed. And here's the output that we produce. We've got a frequency table showing us that 35% of the respondents had travelled overseas in the last 12 months. So the proportion of people in the sample who travel overseas in the last 12 months is greater than 0.25, that proportion from 2010, our reference proportion. But this is just a sample, and the proportion in the population is probably a bit different from this. If we had to guess the proportion of Australians who travelled overseas, our best guess would be 0.35, the proportion in our sample. But that's unlikely to be exactly the same as the population proportion. What we need to ask ourselves is, have we got enough information here to convince us that the proportion in the population, all adult Australians, is more than 0.25? As with metric variables, there are two approaches that we could take here. One's to look at the 95% confidence interval for the proportion, and the other is to do a significance test. So let's start with the 95% confidence interval approach. On the Blackboard website, you'll find a Java applet that calculates 95% confidence intervals for the proportion. And that'll give you an output that looks like this. So you can see here the 95% confidence interval is from 0.26 to 
that's telling us that we can be 95% confident that the proportion of adult Australians who travelled overseas in the last 12 months is between 0.26 and 0.44. So it looks like we can be confident that the proportion of Australians who travel overseas has increased since 2010 when it was only 0.25. We're convinced that the proportion has increased. So as in our example with the metric data, we could approach our hypothesis more directly by doing a significance test. In this case, as we're dealing with categorical data and comparing a sample proportion to some known reference proportion, a one-sample t-test is not appropriate. We need a different sort of test and the test we use here is called a binomial test. So the sample proportion is given here in the column headed observed proportion and it's 0.35, the same as what we got in our frequency table. We're comparing this sample proportion to the proportion of Australians who travelled overseas in 2010 and that was 0.25, our test proportion. When we report a binomial test the statistics that we present are just the size of the sample, n is 111, and the p-value, 0.011. As with the one sample t-test, we can say that the test is significant if the p-value is less than 0.050. In this case, the p-value is 0.011. This is less than 0.050, so the test is significant. We can conclude that the sample proportion is significantly higher than 0.25. That is, we've got enough evidence to convince us that the proportion of Australians who travel overseas has increased since 2010. Note that in this case the p-value is given as 0.011, exactly the same as it's given in the SPSS output. The only case when you don't report the p-value to three decimal places exactly as the SPSS output gives is when the p-value is given by SPSS as 0 0.000. In that case, you'd report P is less than 0.001, but in every other case, P equals exactly the value that's given in the SPSS output. So how would we go about writing a report on this binomial test? So how would we go about writing a report on the binomial test? The report has exactly the same structure as the report for the one-sample t-test. You should start with a research question or a hypothesis. You should give some information about the sample, say what sort of test was used, state if the test is significant or not with the supporting statistics, interpret the 95% confidence interval for the proportion, and finish with a conclusion that relates back to the original research question or hypothesis. So let's have a look at what the report would look like. We start with our introduction. A travel agent who hypothesized that the percentage of Australians who travel overseas has increased since 2010. Then we give some information about the sample, so we say who, what the sample consisted of in a random sample of 111 adult Australians, and we give the proportion or the percentage in the sample. So 35% had travelled overseas in the past 12 months. We then compare that to our reference percentage, so this is higher than the percentage of Australians who travelled overseas in 2010, 25%, and make sure you give that reference percentage as part of your report. And a binomial test shows that the difference is significant, and we quote the size of the sample and the p-value. They're the relevant statistics to support our decision that the difference is significant. We then give the 95% confidence interval. The 95% confidence interval indicates that between 26% and 44% of Australians have travelled overseas in the past 12 months. And then finally, we finish with a conclusion. And this conclusion is explicitly relating back to the hypothesis that we started with. So as expected, the percentage of Australians who travel overseas has increased since 2010. So that's the report for a binomial test. Now, as we've gone through this week's lecture, I've mentioned hypotheses and research questions. Now, these are related but different. So let's have a look at what is the difference between a research question and a hypothesis. So a research question, as the name implies, is a question. What proportion of Australian adults are married? Have working hours increased? How long does it take people to travel to work? These are all research questions. So a hypothesis turns the research question into a statement, a prediction. For example, the proportion of Australian adults who are married has decreased in the last 30 years. Working hours have increased since 2000-2001. The time it takes to travel to work has changed since. 
So research questions are questions that are being posed. A hypothesis is a prediction. So in summary, a binomial test is appropriate when you've got categorical data and you're comparing a sample proportion to some reference or test proportion. While the one sample t-test is relevant when you've got metric data and you're comparing a sample mean to some reference or test mean. So with both of these tests, you're testing against a fixed known value. When you do any sort of significance test, the way you make your significance decision is to compare your p-value to 0 0.050. If p is less than 0 0.05, the test is significant. If p is greater than 0 0.05, the test is not significant. So as a checklist for this week, you should read through modules 2.1 to 2.5 of the textbook. You should work through appendices A4 and A5. And if it helps, watch the SPSS videos on the one sample t-test and the binomial test. And you should complete topic test 3. This has been a Swinburne production.